A uh, little background on myself. Uh, back in uh, 1965, I started to work at a dealership as a mechanic, and I worked as a mechanic in the shop till uh, late 60s, and then I got into truck sales. Then about 1970, I took over as a sales manager. Then I went, uh, took over another dealership, and then in 80, I left that dealership, went to work for another dealership, worked there for seven years, and my goal was to own a dealership. I don't know why sometimes, but uh, anyhow, we, uh, I ended up uh, buying into a dealership up in uh, Stony Ridge, Ohio, which is up by Toledo in uh, 1988, I think it was. And uh, two and a half years ago, uh, I sold out. We had three dealerships at that point, and uh, it was time to let somebody else have a, you know, I had 65 employees, and so I just said, now is the time to get rid of it. So, and uh, I started collecting trucks back in the 70s. I think it was uh, about 73, I bought a C30 International. And my first wife, she just had a fit. She told me that uh, if I bought another one, she was gonna leave me. So I bought two, make sure she didn't come back. <laughs> and, uh, and I tell people that old trucks are like martinis. You have one's good, two's better, and after three, you just can't have enough, so. We've collected them, and a big portion of the trucks have collected. We bought at uh, reasonable prices, you know, not, didn't pay a lot of money for most of them. And uh, I've done all the mechanic work on it. I used to do some paint work, and uh, now I've, I hire out all the paint work to be done. But we put together, about five years ago, we put a building together. It's 100 by 160 in Clyde, Ohio, and it's all heated and lighted, and it's, uh, and we open it up, uh, it's for private viewing. We don't open it to the public, uh, mainly because of the cost of insurance, and you gotta man it then and everything, so. But we have a group come in, uh, they have uh, Christmas parties there, we do a lot of things with it, so. If you're ever in that Toledo area, give me a holler, and if I'm around, I'll show it to you, if I'm not, now and then in the winter time, I spend most of that in Florida, so. But uh, the auto wagons were probably the, the, our favorite to collect. The, I like all the older ones, the ones the, without hydraulic brakes on them. Those with hydraulic brakes are a pain in the neck. They always working on them. Uh, we still, with as many as we have, we still have a lot of work every day to to keep them going. We, uh, uh, there's always something breaking on them. And now most of that stuff you have to uh, get parts made. You don't have the parts yourself and, and you can't go to a shelf and buy them. So. And we find some stuff from other antique cars like Model T's and some stuff that you can interchange and make fit and work. So, uh, but the we, the 1907s was the first ones, the oldest one we have, and uh, they're pretty simple vehicle. They, the engines are pretty simple. Uh, they're two cylinder opposed, the air cooled ones had a five inch bore and a five inch stroke. Uh, the water cooled ones had a four and a half inch bore and a five inch stroke. And we, I just recently took one apart, uh, overhauled it. Uh, this place in Cleveland makes piston rings for them. Uh, and you can get those parts and you just keep scrounging around until you find somebody else that has them. And a lot of these uh, auto wagons have come, they've come to me. Somebody says, geez, I have this old car, I wanna sell it. And uh, what's this worth? And, that's kind of a hard one because it's hard to be buyer and seller both, so. But uh, we like getting them out. We enjoy having them out. Uh, we have a J30 touring car, a 1911, 
and there's only a half a dozen of those that we know in existence. So we're pretty fortunate to have that. Uh, other than that, uh, on uh, International put out a, a little brochure back in the uh, uh, teens when they were building these, and it's kind of cute. If you get a chance, you want to take a look at it. Uh, it shows the different trucks and the different bodies that they put on them, and uh, it mentions in there on the cost of delivery and what does it cost you to deliver uh, your merchandise. And so it's a it's a pretty nice. This is a reproduction. I took an original and had it reproduced, but uh, it's got the different bodies. They even showed school bus bodies, uh, uh, stake bodies, most everything on them. But uh, in our collection of trucks, we run all the way up to 1984. Uh, I've got one truck that's only has uh, 21 miles on it. It came. It was a local truck. It uh, came from a carriage company right there in Toledo, and they bought five of those in 1941. And they were a little cab over DS 300s. They had a four-speed transmission and a two-speed rear, and they bought five of them in 1941 you couldn't buy tires so they took this one took the tires off put it on their trailer parked it in the corner of the building and it sat in the corner of that building for 50 years and I was fortunate enough to find out the guy had it for sale and I had an early edition of the wheels of time and it had that advertisement in it and I said I know who that is so I called him up and I said you want to sell you're wanting to sell that and he said yeah I said can I come and look at it he said oh I'm busy today and I'm sitting there nervous as a newlywed and I said well how about tomorrow and he said okay so I went the next day and he told me what he wanted for it and I said well how about if I do I said why did you decide to sell it you told me you were gonna fix it up he said, well, IRS is on him, and you know how IRS is, they're going to come and attach everything. So I said, well, here, I'll give you this much cash, and then you tell IRS all you got is what the check was. And he said, that sounded good. So I bought it and got it home. It took me five years to find all the pieces that they'd stole off that truck. They took the axle shaft out of it. They took, uh, there wasn't a grease fitting any place in this truck. They'd taken the grease fittings off to use it to fix their other trucks in the shop. They took half the carburetor apart, the upper half, which, you know, they ruined the whole thing. They took the oil pressure regulator out of the engine. Half the distributor was gone. Uh, axle shaft was missing. Uh, axle spring pins were gone. But I got it home. It took me five years, and I walked many miles up in Carlisle and Hershey finding pieces and parts for it and uh, over the years you know in doing this being a dealer I had the opportunity to other dealers said geez you got them old trucks I got a bunch of old parts why don't you come and buy them and I would go to their dealership and uh, they would tell me well I got this what do you give me for it and almost any offer at that time, they were tickled to death with just to get it out of their inventory. So I ended up with a bunch of sheet metal and stuff. And that helped in collecting the trucks because if I had a set of fenders for a truck sitting on the shelf at home, all I did is look for a truck that needed a set of fenders that looked bad, and I'd put that set of fenders on it. So I bought one of the junkyards out in South Dakota that way was a county truck and they had every fender bent up on it but the truck was in nice shape so I took it home put fenders on it painted it up and uh, it's a really nice looking truck now what model is that doing? that's a, a B100 pickup and I've got just about every model design truck that they're that International built a couple years ago, I bought uh, 
a real nice truck from a pretty lady that had a 28 International and uh, fortunately she let me uh, purchase it because it's it's really nice it's maroon in color and uh, we really enjoy that anybody got any questions or uh, anything you want to ask me I, I talk for hours about stuff but most of the time you don't want to hear it so how many trucks do you have I don't know how many trucks I have <laughs> now that's the truth I really don't we well, we've probably, got within a dozen oh probably 75 maybe more we just keep collecting them and and I and I'm at the point now where I'm thinking that I ought to look at those that we don't have done we've got them all inside the building we don't have we don't leave anything set out it's once we have it it's it's we try to preserve it at least where it's at and uh, I think now maybe I ought to start selling some of them so I don't create too big of a monster for my family when I'm gone and we think about those things but not you know, you look at it and you say, geez, I'm going to live forever, but that's not going to happen. So, we... Uh, George, you, you, in your collection, you have more modern trucks than most collectors. You've got trucks from the 80s and the 90s. You, that's, yeah, I've got, that's an important thing, I think. That I've got a 9670. Uh, it's an 84. Or no, yeah, it's an 84. <laughs> and it's got 16,000 miles on it and this I bought from Caterpillar Engine Company Caterpillar got it from International they put a took a perfectly good 400 Cummins engine out of it and put a 3176 CAT engine in it and they'd sent it to Dana Corporation in Toledo to get uh, tests done on a nine-speed uh, Spicer transmission they let it sit there. It sat there over 10 years in their parking lot and never moved a wheel. And I had bought some trucks from Dana. They had some test trucks and they were selling that stuff off. And I bought almost all the trucks they had. And I bought a couple test engines they had. And this truck sat out there. And I asked the guy, and he, the guy from Dana said, as far as I'm concerned, you could have the thing. I want it out of the parking lot. And I said, well, we can't do that. So he gave me the guy's name from Caterpillar, and I got a hold of Caterpillar and called him, and we negotiated back and forth on the price, and I ended up buying it. And uh, we took it home, and it had sat so long, the brake springs had rusted off in the brake in the wheels. And we had to put new brake springs on the brakes on it. Still had original tires on it. The tires were in great shape. We pumped all the dead fuel out of it, put fresh fuel, new filters, and, and we started it up, and uh, the thing ran good, and then about two days later, we had an injector go bad, and we had to replace an injector, but other than that, we haven't done anything with it. Uh, it's the interior, it's, it's perfect, it's really a, a, a great truck, and uh, we've got a an 82 1700 that was a test truck that Dana had that's got a um, nine-speed transmission in it and a two-speed rear end it's a 1700 series a 1754 series with a DT 360 engine in it and uh, that trucks just like brand new so we've preserved this stuff and and like I said put some of that newer stuff here about uh, oh, a month and a half ago uh, we had a guy come to us and said hey you remember my dad's old pickup and he said yeah he said well I'm thinking about selling it he had 23,000 miles on it it's a 70 international pickup a one ton a 1300 series with a nine foot pickup box on it and the inside of that pickup box is perfect it don't look like he did anything with it he hauled grain in it and uh, but we took it and uh, got it running of course we had to go through the brakes on it and 
did all that. But this is the roughest riding truck that I ever drove in my life. <laughs> this thing's like a kangaroo. It just, <laughs> just hop, hop, hop. So, uh, and and the part of the the thing with some of these old trucks is the hunt when you find them and you, you get them and uh, you know it's kind. Of, I tell people it's like a courtship. You know, once you get the hunt, you find it, and finally you get it. Okay, well, let's go find another one now. So, so but it's, uh, I've got trucks from all over the country. We've got some that came out of Nebraska. We got some out of South Dakota. I got a red baby that come out of Nebraska. Uh, we've got a truck there that came from a local brewing company that was, uh, they used to have a, a brewery in a small town of Milan, Ohio. And this was a, one of their brewery trucks. And the guy had it in his barn and this thing was sinking in the dirt. And We tried to buy it from him and finally one day he called us up and he said, hey, he said, you still interested in that truck? And I said, yeah. He said, well, we're remodeling the kitchen in the house and we're running a little short of money and my wife says that old truck in the barn needs to go and we can finish this kitchen so we ended up with that and uh, we went uh, got a 33 international that came out of uh, Kansas City uh, we went to the sale and a half hour after we bought that truck we were back on the road headed home that's all we wanted and we've got uh, uh, the shovel nose trucks, the hard rubber tire trucks. And there's a tire company in uh, Kansas City that's got, that puts those hard rubber tires and they'll, without taking the rims off the wood wheels, they will mold that tire right back on there. And uh, it's a kind of a costly project, but it's really, uh, to preserve them, you hate to take those wheels apart because those wooden spokes and them rims get rusted and it's hard to get them back like they were, so. Tell us about your relationship with the movie industry. Oh Who's yeah. the go-to guy? Yeah, well we've had several trucks in movies. We did, uh, I had two trucks in the movie Hoffa. They filmed the movie Hoffa up in Detroit, Michigan. And uh, we had two trucks in that, and that was a fun time to do. They, they paid us for the trucks, and then they paid us to drive our own trucks because you, uh, there's nobody, they had the Teamsters up there, and the Teamsters says, no, we're driving the trucks. And I said, no, they're not driving my truck. And uh, so they had the Teamsters, they just had a half a dozen of them there that they watched the garage where we parked the trucks and that was their job at the, but that was fun. And then we had one in, uh, they did Telling Lies in America. I had a 51 International in that movie. That was filmed in Cleveland. And then they did Shawshank Redemption and they uh, rented a, a van from us and I had it in a paint shop getting ready to paint it red and put an IH logo on it and they said oh no no we got this has got to be white we got to have it white we'll paint it and I said no my painter's got to paint it because these movie people they just they use they paint it with a broom so they painted it white and then they lettered a nursing home on it they took it to Mansfield and they had it for about uh, two weeks in Mansfield. That's where they filmed Shawshank Redemption, a big portion of it. Well, this ended up, uh, this truck ended up on the cutting room floor. We never got in the movie. But they paid for the paint jobs and then they paid me to paint it back red again. But I forgot to paint it red. <laughs> so it's, uh, in the movie people, then I had uh, about five years ago uh, they were doing the movie uh, Real Steel and they wanted to buy a truck from me and 
by this time I'm pretty independent with them and I said no I'll lease you the truck but when you're done with it I want it back you know just the way you had it in the movie well anyhow they found somebody that would sell them an ACO that's a sight liner I don't know if you've seen them they got the, the windows up down by your feet they serve no purpose other than you can see somebody's feet but uh, you can't see anything out of it because it's under the dash so uh, they uh, they said well we need these Lone Stars and I had two brand new Lone Stars there and I said okay I'll they said well we'll give you eight hundred dollars a day I said no twelve hundred dollars a day they said no nope. we'll get them from somebody else I said okay a few days later they called me back and they said well we need both of them and uh, We'll pay you a thousand. I said no, twelve hundred. So they paid me twelve hundred dollars a day plus freight to take them to Detroit, where they were filming it, and then picking the trucks back up again. And uh, in fact, my uh, secretary said, she said, Mr. Mitchell, you made more money on those trucks, loaning them to the movie people, and they were just back sets. They just sat, as, and you'll see them in the movie if you look for them, but. Uh, she said, you made more money lacing them to them than you do selling them. So, so that's, that's been an experience with the movie people. They're, they're cheap, you know, but, uh, and you know, I had this arm out the window of the truck and they could have put the camera on me or Jack Nicholson when they were doing uh, the Hoffa movie. I didn't make it. Just this elbow. <laughs> That's all you see is my elbow. So, but it was it was fun doing it. We uh, filmed in the middle of the night. That's uh, uh, we'd go up at eleven o'clock at night, and they watered the streets down, and they wanted the streets to look wet because they didn't want to see oil marks and stuff on the streets. They turned street lights off and did all kinds of things there. And then they had these trucks and they would stage them. And they, they put a mark on the ground and then you drive this truck through and Jack Nicholson and Danny DeVito, they're hollering at you. And, you know, because we were driving through picket lines is what we were doing, so. And nobody hit us, nobody shot us either, so. But it was, it was a fun time to do, so. But when the movie people want you to do something, doesn't mean that you have to, just because they offer you a price, doesn't mean you gotta stay with it, dude. You suit yourself, and there's some things, you know, they wanna use it, and they wanna blow it up. Yeah, they're not gonna blow up one of my trucks, so. What model was the truck in Shawshank? In the Shawshank Redemption? It was a Metro, an AM uh, 150. It's in Milestone. Milestone. Yeah, it's in the Milestones book. Yeah, there's, uh, they, uh, they did the book Milestones and they come out and we dragged trucks out of the building and filmed them and did all kinds of things. Uh, that was a fun time too. Uh, we had uh, the toy people uh, come out and they digitized with a camera uh, one of the pickups, uh, the R model pickup and then they made the model out of it and then they sell them and they they i think they give me a couple or three of them something like that just for letting them measure out the truck they measure fenders they measure width they do everything with it so and uh pat Ertle did the book uh international trucks this was what 10 15 years ago and uh, from Vintage Truck, he's the editor, or the owner of Vintage Truck. He was out at my place. We're pulling trucks out of the building, giving them a bath. He's filling, he's taking pictures of them, and then putting them back in and go getting another one. And so, so when you got a collection like that, somebody's always got something that you know. And and we take them to the local shows. Uh, they have some. Uh, farmer crop days we take trucks that have farm bodies on them and we'll stage them there and and 
I got a 29 International that I put a false floor in one time and we put air corn in it. And uh, we only had about uh, oh, six or eight inches of air corn in it. But it looked kind of cute going down the road with a load of corn in it. So. And you, that, that green uh, load star that's in Milestones, you're still using it? Yeah. That? Yeah, we got a green uh, 75 International Load Star. Uh, this truck goes back many years. I sold the truck brand new to the company. The company sold it to a farmer, and the farmer had a friend of mine put the bed on it. He hand built the bed on the bed, the bed and a hoist. Well, we got it, and it was in the bottom of the cab was starting to rust out, and so I found it a an Air Force cab come off of an Air Force truck. We took that Air Force cab, which was an air brake cab. Now we got a truck with hydraulic brakes and an air brake cab. So we took the cab and uh, put that on it. Then we changed the front axle, the rear axle, changed the engines. So the only real part of this truck is the frame and the transmission and the bed on the back. Everything else has been changed, but it's a nice truck with air brakes on it. And you're hauling and, grain with it? Yeah, we're we'll hauling grain with it every fall. We haul beans and corn, whatever we want with it, and load it up real good and take it down the elevator and, and use it. And I have a I have a semi trailer that we used to put trucks in and now I'm I'm not driving semi anymore. I uh, I think it's time for me to not drive a truck that with a 53 foot trailer on it. So now we're going to sell the semi trailer. It's a, um, I think it's a 92 Stoughton, but it's a step deck. It's low to the ground and it accommodates a lot of vehicles in there. You can put, we hauled a school bus in there. In the museum, we have a uh, Ford school bus that was my brother's, and he had restored it. And uh, we've got that in there. We put that school bus inside the semi van. We had about three inches on each side of it inside there to get it in and get it out. So, and we got uh, we got the Farm All H tractor and. Uh, some other international, we got some Cub Cadets, and a few things like that, but we've stuck mostly with trucks, collecting trucks, and uh, it's been fun. It's been a fun time. Did, did I see a Fruhoff trailer sitting outside your place there? Yeah, yeah, we got a couple stainless steel Fruhoff trailers, semi trailers. We've got a tr truck that came from Molder Concession, the, the Carnival people. Uh, and we bought a open top trailer that used to haul a Ferris wheel in that trailer. And we got a guy that's got a 1910 Ferris wheel and been trying to buy the Ferris wheel from him and we've been kind of back and forth price wise on it. And Now I don't know what a 1910 Ferris wheel is worth. I don't know if anybody can tell me what one's worth, but we talked price and we had a kind of a standoff on it. So, and I, I don't know, the only thing we thought if I got the Ferris wheel, we'd put it up and at least run it once and then put it in the trailer. So, we got the trailer for it, and that's really what it should be. That whole Ferris wheel should be sitting in that trailer uh, to preserve part of history, too. So, a large part of your collection is all your signs and memorabilia. You might want to maybe talk about Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've got a big collection of signs. There's, and porcelain signs, and you watch Pickers at all, you'll see all these porcelain signs. Well, we've got one building that's as big as this here, except it's taller, and there isn't a place on the wall, any place, that there isn't a porcelain sign hanging. We have Cedar Point signs, we have, and almost all of them are quality 
signs. We don't, we, no, we collect no cigarette or beer signs. Now that's just a personal thing, but uh, it's, we've got all the rest of the signs. We got all the dealer signs. We got the triple diamond signs, the IHC signs, uh, the IH signs, uh, the early uh, international when they used the, trip, the double diamond. And the sand background, on, you let me one once, I think McCormick Deering, yeah. really old. Yeah, we've got one that's that's uh, probably from in the teens and uh, it's got the IHC and it's a glass. Uh, it's a sign that you put, they painted it and then they put like glass on the to reflect it. It's, uh, and we've collected signs all over the country. And we went to Seymour, Iowa, and the only thing that was in this sale was a household sale. The only thing that was there was a Model F International, the shovel nose truck. All pretty much original. And it had been painted a couple times, but it was, you know, it was a brush type paint. That's, we got out there and we said, geez, we're gonna steal this one. We're gonna get this one wrong. <laughs> we sat there and a partner of mine, I told him, I said, you know, that's enough, quit bidding. He kept bidding, we left there with it. The guy that was bidding against us, he said, uh, how much were you going to pay for that? And I said, I guess we were going to pay enough to own it. So, <laughs> but, but we, that was probably the most expensive truck we had at that time. And, uh, but it's, it, that truck, you go out and it just, it fires up, runs nice. And it's a, it's a nice old truck. So. Are, are the high wheelers your favorite? Well, everybody says, what's your favorite truck? And you know, it's really hard to say which one's favorite. I like all of them, and each one of them's got its own story of where it came from and who had it. And uh, we're in the process of doing that. Uh, my partner's son is a college professor, and he's gonna take a tape recording, and I'll go down the line with each truck that we have, where it came from, who had it, and and uh, some history on it because a lot of that goes away. When I go away, a whole lot of that will go away. And there's things I remember and that I've experienced that other people, if you don't pass it on to somebody, it's, it's gone forever. So, yeah. Those uh, two-speed trucks that they used in the 30s to build the Hoover Dam, uh, two, three years ago when we did the roundup in South Dakota. I hunted all over for one of those trucks. And they just, uh, do you have, uh, what? Uh, uh, George Kirkham's got, uh, yeah, yeah, he he's had, got he one. He had one, he wasn't yeah. willing to bring it. Uh, no. Course, oh, but, that's, but, but that was the only one I run across. Yeah, that's the only one I know that's of. That's a Smithsonian I, piece there. Should be in the Smithsonian, that's. The one George Kirkham yeah, has. Yeah. But uh, it's like some of these, you know, it's like the truck I've got that's only got 22 miles on it. That's, that's unheard of, you know. Yeah. Uh, and the story, that I did print in the window of it, it tells the story why it's only got 21 miles on it. It's just what I told you. And uh, it's, uh, those are, uh, some of those are pretty unique. I like the old ones mostly because they're simple to work on uh, and kind of a challenge sometimes to, you know, to make them run. Uh, my auto wagons, as I've been getting to them, I've been uh, putting electric start on them because uh, cranking them's not much fun when you're in your 70s. When you're 40, you can crank anything. I know a guy that cranked a 501 engine in a bulldozer a 501 cubic inch, but he's a strong guy. I don't think he's doing that now. So, and out there by us too, there's a big construction club that, that has uh, 
construction equipment that's all restored and uh, it, what is it every other year every three years every three years they have a show right at Bowling Green Ohio and it's a great show if you ever get to go to a construction show that probably be one of the most fun shows you see it's not stationary I mean some of the stuff stationary but they got these drag lines they got dozers they got pants they got all this stuff playing in the dirt they've got a sandbox for big kids and that's exactly what it looks like it looks like a big kid sandbox because they've dug a pond and it's uh, and it's interesting to see this old uh, uh, construction equipment, the same thing like the old trucks, to see them out there running and working. So, and the construction is in different parts of the country every year, right, Mike? Yeah, right, it moves around. Yeah, this year's in North yeah. Carolina. But you can look it up on the, the what's the website? H-C-E-A.net. H-C-E-A.net. And that's historical construction Equipment Association .net. So, and once you get to that site, they got a nice site. They put out a magazine like the rest of the other, uh, like Vintage Truck or uh, Harvester Heritage or any of those. They they have a nice magazine. And the only thing with the magazines, did you ever notice that the classified should be right in the front? Because when we get that book, what do we do? open the back and see what's for sale. <laughs> I think my wife hides the book on me sometimes. So it's, and uh, she, uh, she says, she doesn't know how many I have. And I said, I don't know either. So. It's a sign of a good marriage. What? It's a sign of a good marriage. I guess it's, uh, you know, you gotta keep them, keep some things a secret. You never line them all up at one time and take a picture of them. <laughs> so, but I've definitely had fun doing this and uh, enjoyed having uh, the trucks. And there isn't a day that I don't have something to work on. It, I always have something to work on. I never run out. Do you have any travel holes? Uh, I had a travel all and a guy come along and he wanted it. It was a 75 and uh, I let him have it. I, it was rusted up across the top of the windshield and it was more than I wanted to do with it. Now I do have a 51 L model travel all. Now there's not many of those around and that came out of uh, Nebraska. And I appraised that going down the road at about 60 mile an hour. I said, hey, hey, over by the airport, there's a, there's a travel home. We're looking like this and we get on by. So we called a friend of ours, the auctioneer up there, and I said, hey, do you know that? He said, well, I know the guys down there in town. So he went down to that town and found out who owned it and gave us the guy's phone number. We called him up and we bought that at 50 mile an hour <laughs> and uh, we went back up and picked it up and uh, it's 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 nice shape it, it was an Air Force uh, travel all and it was at the airport up there and uh, the guy that owned it he owned a building right there by the airport and he had bought it and he gave it to his grandson and his grandson really didn't want it I mean he he was glad to find somebody that would buy it so we've got that at home that's been inside so and that's that's different you know uh, I don't have a travel at uh, we've kind of I've got uh, I think four scouts got an 80 a, a V800 and a uh, 78 Scout and a 79 Scout. We bought a Scout uh, three years ago that 
International had put a Chevy engine in it at the factory in 1978. They were trying to meet emissions, and they didn't make the emissions, so they uh, pulled the engine back out of it and they set it outside. Well, it sat outside for several years, and then they put it up for auction, and the engineer that worked on the, the job, he had bought it and he took it home. And a friend of mine, Sam Elliott, told me, he said, hey, there's a scout for sale, George, you ought to have it. So we went over to see him and uh, we bought it and took it home and took the uh, Chevy mounts out of the frame, welded the international mounts back in and put this all back together just like it was originally with the 345 V8 in it. And uh, I took that down to my home in Florida and I use that, I go to the daily, sh to the shows down there with it, the uh, cruise ins. Uh, I drive it some down there. I don't have too many miles on it now. I think I got five or 600 miles on it now. So I probably shouldn't have driven it all. I should have just put it together, but you know, you can only keep so much stuff. The 79 Scout we have used to be our service truck at the dealership. And anybody ever saw a service truck at a dealership, you would find something that is beat up from one end to the other. The mechanics and the high school kids that wore, that the Scout wore out was, I don't know how many, but I got new panels for it, and I put new panels all the way around on it, went through the whole thing, and I painted it Cadillac Escalade pearl white. And when the guy got the paint for me, he said, George, you sure you want to paint that, put that paint on it? And I said, yeah, that's what I want. He said, it's $800 just for the paint. I said, put it on it, I want it. So it's painted Cadillac pearl essence white. It really looks nice and it's a terror pickup, so. And it's not a dent on it any place. When we were introducing the Lone Star, you yeah. worked with the guys in Fort Wayne, I think, yeah. and sold them one of your trucks that, that went on to become the D-Mods. Yeah. They, International came to me and wanted to buy a D-model pickup truck, a D-Series, a 39 D-model, 38, 39. I said, well, there's one in Minnesota that's on eBay. Uh, you ought to buy that one. So about two days before the sale was going to end, I called him up and I said, are you bidding on that pickup? And he said, no, I haven't got the okay from International yet. I said, well, okay. I said, if you're not going to bid on it, I'm going to. So. He said, well, go ahead and bid on it. So I ended up, I bought it. He called me the next day. He said, did you get it bought? And I said, yeah. He said, oh, okay. Didn't say no more. So I went up to Minnesota, picked it up, got it home, still on the trailer. And he calls me up and he said, hey, that pickup, I want to buy that pickup. And I said, well, you know what I paid for it. And he said, yeah, but he said, give me a price of what you want for it. And I said, no, I don't want to sell it. So he made me an offer and I said, no, I don't want to sell it. Called me back the next day, made me another offer. I said, I don't want to sell it. This dance went on for several days and finally uh, it got uh, up enough that I felt that I ought to sell it. So I sold it to International and they sent it to a place up in Michigan. And fortunately I was able to be involved in it. I could see what they were doing with it and they put uh, a 7.3 diesel engine in it with an Allison automatic behind it and put this all together and they did a gorgeous job of putting it together. Now the old engine, the transmission in the rear end and the front end, guess who got that? Me, because they didn't want it. It was junk to the company that was doing it. So uh, I put all that together and, 
and uh, well, I still have the engine for that. So, but Dad, I would have loved to had that truck when they were done with it. It's just yeah, it's, we, we just saw it two days ago. Yeah. It's just it's, it's just sitting it's yeah. sitting gathering dust, but it's still so that radiator in the in the bed of the truck. I mean, that's yeah. crazy. You have to do that. I need to know who I need to talk to to buy it back. <laughs> then I'd have to be adding money to it. I could buy a lot of old trucks if you were to come and buy that one. Yeah. And International's got some uh, trucks in the, in the Natmus Museum over in Auburn, Indiana. That's There's two museums. There's the Auburn Cord Duesenberg Museum, which has the prototype, the 80 series Scout, in that, but the Natmus Museum behind it is uh, National Truck and Automotive Museum. But they uh, they've got downstairs there. They've got a whole display of international engines. In fact, they got a clay built travel all that's about six foot long, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And nice. Look, we, why did we ever give that stuff away? Well. You're right. I don't know why International ever gave all that stuff away, but they did. They, you know, and are, if you look at some of the younger people, they say, I don't want that. That's junk. You know, they don't have any. Now, I tell most people, and I don't know about most of us, but most of us, I didn't start really getting serious about collecting things until I was about 40. Uh, I uh, was in my 30s, I'd collected the first truck, and then I got divorced, and then I didn't have any money to do anything with it, except keep it in and pay bills. And so I did that for a while, and once my kids were out of the nest, I said, gee, it's Friday, I still got some money in my pocket, what happened? <laughs> and uh, so then you start putting the money into the, some of these old vehicles. and so, That's all I got. I don't know if anybody got any questions. So, so you have a, a Lone Star sitting there. How, how do you think that adds up to, I mean, how well, do you rate that next to the, the, the classics you've got? Well, we got a brand new Lone Star, sit, Lone Star sitting there. Now, anybody who looked at a Lone Star knows that that's the one, the big point at front. It's a lot of money invested doing nothing. It probably should be put to work. We're not sure what we're going to do yet, but uh, if we don't have to put it to work, we won't. Uh, it'll probably end up in a museum piece with uh, 2,400 miles on it. That's all that's on it. And uh, that was the last truck I sold. The last truck I had in inventory, I sold that one. Uh, and uh, we put that in a museum. And we take it in and out. We drive it around a little bit there to keep it, everything going on it. But, it's just a beautiful truck. I but I don't, I don't know that that my grandkids or anybody else will want to collect something like that. Most of the kids today think about well, what it's worth, and you know, we think about preserving history, and they think about well, what's that worth? I'll sell it to somebody, you know. And a lot of this collection of stuff is starting to go overseas too. You got the foreign people buying, coming to sales, buying stuff up, and and you'll see things at auction where they're buying it up. So you kind of got to take, <coughs> kind of got to take the attitude of one fellow I talked to about a machine he had. He just said, "Well, he says I don't know if it's hurting anything right where it's at." Yeah, well, that's true. A lot of people say, well, I'll just leave it sit. I'm not interested in selling it. No, it's not hurting a thing. But I, I, I tell people that we don't own any of this stuff. We're just custodians of it. And the only thing I want to be is a good custodian of what we have now. And I think that's what everybody in this room is good custodians. You just, you look at it and you take good care of the, what you have. And, and hopefully we can pass it on to somebody else and Someday somebody else will say, geez, I can't, geez, Grandpa collected all them trucks. Do you remember how many trucks Grandpa had? 
So, and I'm fortunate, I got great grandkids. I got nine great grandkids. The oldest ones are 14, so. George, if you leave a couple of those trucks to me, I'll take good care of them. Okay, there, there, I got I to take her, I got to keep her there, so. I thank everybody.